All right, brilliant. Uh, Bobby Healy, welcome to the Innovation Civilization Podcast. What a great pleasure to have you here today. A pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. And Premier, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you back. Pleasure to be back, Wahid. Brilliant. Um, so let's get right to it, Bobby. Uh, just to peg our goalposts a little bit, can you tell us a bit more on who you are, what you do, and what's your origin story, basically, how you got from who you are to doing delivery of drones now? Yeah. Um, well, I'm a techie. Uh, started my career building video games for Nintendo about 100 years ago now, it seems. Uh, <laughs> I played that back in the day. Uh, yeah. Michael yeah. Jackson's Moonwalker. I wrote that game and a bunch of others. Terrible games, but uh, good fun. And mm -hmm. since then, I've always been a startup guy. I've built, this is my sixth um, business that I founded. Uh -huh. uh, the last uh, two last three actually were travel technology businesses and then i've been building mana for the last five years and i've you know done well in, in travel tech SaaS type businesses uh, i enjoy it i like building teams i like building strategy executing on it and um and mana is just a continuation of that i'll be at much bigger space we're serving yeah. a much more difficult business to build as well that's that's brilliant and we'll get into it a little bit as well but just for the audience that um you're you're what it comes to say like you're like a serial entrepreneur or like a serial operator you know in the operating space right like building stuff and in different industries and and really seeing the meat of things from the um from the inside in a lot of ways right um so can you yeah tell for me, sure yeah 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 can you tell me a bit more about like very quickly um what is mana and what, what you guys are doing just for the audience so Ma mana is mana drone delivery and it's a it's a technology in aircraft and a bunch of software components that that do last mile delivery so think mm -hmm. three to five mile radius operation carrying mm -hmm. cargo of any type really but uh, we can carry a cargo of 3.5 kilos roughly eight mm -hmm. pounds and mm -hmm. a volume of about eight gallons or 30 liters may yeah. to be safely and at scale and and that's Mana Drone Delivery. Our, our mission is to make the world a better place by making lightning fast delivery affordable, mm. green, private, and safe. And yeah. we're a long way towards solving that mission already. Incredible. So it's basically like this. I was just, you know, seeing some of your like videos and reading stuff that if I order a coffee now, basically it's going to get to me in like what, like three minutes or something like that. Um, is that, is that correct? Yeah. The flight time is two yeah. minutes, 40 seconds flight That's time. Incredible. And then it takes us about, yeah, it takes about 30 seconds to load the cargo on the aircraft, but it's, I mean, the coffee is perfect. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's incredible. So your, your company basically take stuff from point A and delivers to point B, like the last mile delivery in terms of uh, getting delivery. So on this podcast, we tend to talk about civilizational technology or significantly important technology that shapes our future, you know, and drone deliveries and advanced air mobility is definitely kind of one of those. So if you were to paint a picture of what the world would look like if MANA was doing like a billion deliveries a year, you know, how would that world look like? Like, um, explain to us how would that change the way maybe we interact um, with with hmm. society, with the economy, our work, our personal lives. Um, yeah, how's it going to change that our culture? You know, uh, in a lot of ways. Like, have you have you thought that through? Like, at the end yeah. scale of things, how would that world sort of look like? Paint us a picture. Yeah, I think if you have ubiquitous movement of goods from. Yeah everyone to everyone else it enables a different way of organizing suburban communities to mm -hmm. around how you get things how and where you produce things mm -hmm. and who people work for and, and the kind of the, i would say the balance of scales on uh between big and small producers and vendors it's kind of all equal now because if you're mm -hmm. as a small vendor able to reach 150,000 customers in three minutes in a scalable way, then you don't need all that footprint that, you know, the, the local bookshop, for example, mm -hmm. the WePower has a better product than Amazon has, right? Because it can reach mm -hmm. all of the community in three minutes. And so therefore the, mm -hmm. the customers more, the local residents of the towns we operate in are more likely to order and buy locally than mm -hmm. some centralized distributions. But but if you really forward wind to the end, you're mm -hmm. going to get to a point where 
everything you get to your home will come via a drone as long as it's small because physics definitely mm. play a role so think okay. groceries think uh takeaway food think obviously perishable products like coffee think all of the non-perishables the bookstore the hardware store everything that you would get into your car or mm -hmm. get on your bicycle now to get you're mm -hmm. gonna just open an app and order it and it'll arrive in three minutes and, and we, we already do this we've been doing this for three years already mm -hmm. and we get orders we see already behaviors that you'd never have seen before mm -hmm. where someone opens the app and they order one onion and that onion Mm -hmm. It arrives in three minutes, and it's because that person needed an onion, and, and it's the most normal thing imaginable now to get a drone delivery of an onion. Because yeah. when when someone gets used to this technology, they use it for everything. And that's mm -hmm. the customer, then the, the, the producer or the, the vendor, if you think about again about urban communities, what you see is all the mm -hmm. restaurants and the stores aligned in one street on the on the in the town. Yeah. And everybody drives that street or they park around that street and they go out and they bulk buy their groceries or they bulk buy all their stuff. And we, mm. we definitely think we're going to drive a change in that. So the granularity and the frequency of ordering and consumption yeah. will change. We, we think food waste will come yeah. down quite a bit um, because people over order food now and they do their weekly shop. So there's a lot of changes. You have to use a crystal ball to guess yeah. exactly how it will pan out. But certainly... The days of very large restaurant footprints where yeah. customers just want to take the food away anyway or get it delivered, we, we should be able to see an end to that and much more efficient production of food and consumption of food and, and everything around that convenience store, perishables, non-perishables, everything will change, we think. And it, But it starts with first rolling out the infrastructure of last mile mm -hmm. delivery to those communities and then they'll build on that. So, Bobby, I think this is a really interesting point that you, you highlighted. You basically talk about you know, food delivery, coffee delivery, grocery delivery, but also you talked about uh, non-perishable items that you know, we would buy from Amazon, books, um, you know, anything that would come from e-commerce websites, right? But you know, there's a point to be, to be made that urgent goods, urgent perishable goods um, um, might have more demand from people because it's, it seems to me that... Um, you know, uh, there's a premium associated with drone deliveries, but um, is there a case where only urgent goods, people who want urgent goods, like hot meals, like medicines, will pay for that premium, and then they will want to pay less for goods that they just buy off of Amazon so that the, is probably not, not urgent? $4 premium you're talking about, right? Uh, which right now I think I saw on Meta. Yeah, for Four yeah, euros, yeah. Four euros, sorry, um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah. yeah, four, probably four fifty now. I think in yeah, yeah. current uh, currency. Um, yeah. So, so f firstly, uh, it's not really a premium. It's, I mean, drone delivery is cheaper than road based delivery. I mean, the the average U.S. Consult, uh, consumer is paying between a fifty and sixty percent premium over the basket value of the goods for delivery by road. And that's driven not by profiteering, it's driven by the cost of delivery drivers. And so actually drone delivery is cheaper than normal delivery, firstly. And then, yeah, you're, you're right, though, on if you, if you compare what Amazon have, like a million products in the store and latency isn't an issue or mm. immediacy isn't an issue and same day or next day is fine. Yeah, of course, I don't think drones will touch that business. I think Amazon will have their own drones doing that. But for our use of things, it's definitely uh, the urgent stuff. So perishable things, as we call it. So the, the, the hot things, the cold things, the ice creams, the beverages, mm. those types of things. Guinness, uh, you know, every, everything that you need when you need it. But there are a lot of things that you can get on Amazon today that will transition to drone yeah. delivery. And th those are things like you know, what I would say is low choice, so small, narrow product sets like hardware stores, bookstores. Mm. So they're non-perishable, but they are needed relatively quickly. So if someone buys a book, they'd love to have it right away. Mm. And if someone's buying a hammer or, or, a, or a drill bit, it's not yeah. because they're going to need it at some point in the future. They need it tomorrow. They need it right now. 
So yeah. even though it's not perishable, it's an immediate need or an immediate desire. Like big difference between need and desire, but customers yeah. treat them both the same way. Yeah. So I think yeah. a, a huge amount of product will be sourced from local vendors. So this mm. is the community hardware store and so on. And yeah. frankly, it's a better product. I mean, you know, I love Amazon. I'm the biggest Amazon user. You know, I, I love the product. But if yeah. I could get something in five minutes versus you know four hours or or, or next day delivery i'm yeah. going to be getting five minutes all day long and i'd be very happy to pay uh five dollars or four euros or whatever it is yeah. for that yeah and we, we wonder, see that in our customers yeah. now i mean yeah yeah i wonder i wonder if that premium or the, the costs extra costs associated with drone deliveries right now is also a question of scale uh, I know that a lot of these kind of um, delivery companies, when they start off, even like Amazon early days, um, as well as like I've worked and seen a lot of um, kind of delivery companies in India, for instance, when they started off, like Flipkart, they would have they would charge a premium for your deliveries. But as they scaled up, and their capex gets you know like proportionally divided over, like you know you're talking about millions of units and stuff, then you can um, overlay the cost and bring down the cost per delivery a little bit more. Is there is there a function of uh, the scale there as well in the future that this just come down? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. The reason we charge now the way we do is we're, we're tiny now. Um, yeah, firstly. exactly. And we, we're not interested in making revenue now. That's not the point of us charging yeah. customers. The point of us charging customers is to understand what true demand looks like. If you give things away for free, you don't get a good data set on true demand. And we want to know what do people really want drone delivery for? We don't want them to just use it because it's free. Um, which they would, uh, mm -hmm. and they'd use it for ways that they wouldn't normally in real life. So that's why we charge. We, we 100 percent we see a hybrid where some mm -hmm. of our some of our partners, for example, Coca Cola is one of our uh, bigger partners. We think they'll have a special relationship with their customers that we power, mm -hmm. and they. I, I don't expect them to be charging five dollars for. Uh, for a can of coke right yeah. so i think there'll be a lot of subscription type behavior that we will enable a around a very low marginal cost delivery so as we scale we definitely see a world where the marginal mm. cost of, of deliveries is measured in cents and not in dollars and, and so that would underpin many mm. other use cases coffee is another great example where we definitely see subscription coffee where it's all you can eat for the household, as much coffee as you want delivered for mm. some monthly fee. And we think that's viable because we're robotic. We have no human cost, no labor uh, yeah. associated with, with the delivery. So that will evolve. But for early days, mm. uh, I mean, I certainly don't think of, of our, even our current pricing as, as a premium. It's definitely mm. not because... I mean, your alternative is if you go with road-based delivery, we're far cheaper than that already. Um, yeah. But your alternative is to drive to the coffee shop to get your coffee or drive to the bookshop to get your book or or, mm. or, or pay Amazon through Amazon Prime. You're paying one way or the other. And yeah. drone delivery is already competitive with any other way of doing it. So I know that it's right to think, to think at least that drone delivery is some premium special way of getting it, but it's not. It's, yeah. it's a complete total replacement for using the road and so it, it will have to come down to the yeah. same uh, if not cheaper cost and yeah. road-based delivery let's um let oh god sorry uh Primer, go ahead. I just, yeah. just quick follow up on that because you know uh, i think there's a you know there's some differing views on the industry about how cost efficient um and also maybe more sustainable drones will be when we have electric and perhaps hybrid trucks that carry goods in bulk um, because a lot of the comparison that I see today is mostly with, you know, existing delivery methods with existing, you know, vehicles today, right? So I wonder yep. if you think um, when we have electric trucks at scale, drone deliveries will still be cost effective compared to that? So it's a different use case you're talking about. What you're talking about is is parcels or package deliveries or posts, things like that. You're not talking about instant consumption because instant consumption can't be solved with the, the guy in the truck. With It doesn't matter if it's electric or not. Um, it, it's If you need the product right away, which is most products, 
mm. then you're going to want it instantly delivered. So you're not going to wait. The guy in the truck in a suburb, it, it, you know, that's going to be twice a day traveling salesman type mm. algorithm, right? So, and that's fine. It's a great business. It's really, really efficient. And it's definitely more efficient to do that than use drones because drones are only viable point to point. They don't do multiple deliveries for drone, but you're thinking about different use cases. We're not solving Amazon package delivery or parcels or posts, any of that stuff. We're solving what do you need right now? Mm. And and that's what we can solve. The truck can never solve uh, because the truck needs a person in the truck. The truck can't be centralized. There's all sorts of reasons the truck doesn't work for that kind of product. So think food delivery, coffee, you know, high frequency, high requirement, perishables and non-perishables, mm. like batteries, like, dumb example, batteries, right? You're going to order batteries. You're not going to wait till tomorrow or, or the evening to get them. Um, mm. Same applies for many, many different things. So yeah. you're right and wrong. You're, you're definitely right. Trucks are more efficient than, than drones because they carry 50 packages across the whole day. But, but you're not right to think that trucks will compete with drones for the, the cases that we solve because they couldn't touch it. Like imagine a, a guy in a truck delivering what, 40 meals, 40 uh, orders for uh, a restaurant doesn't, doesn't yeah. scale at all. If I, can, if I can quickly ask, by the way, because a lot of people kind of come and criticize technologists and basically say that you guys are just inventing toys more and more <laughs> and asking people um, like converting a like a like a want to a need you know or, or something like that like um, like concocting and generating needs and wants yeah. so what is what is the problem exactly that you're trying to solve are you saying that today the way we get instant deliveries is not better you know um, and like I, if I just order just eat the other day, you know, which is like the app here for food, it actually comes like within like 20 minutes or something like that. Are you yeah. saying that the, the current systems are broken? Like how is uh, drone deliveries any better? Like, uh, yeah. Give us the yeah. feel. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a number of different ways. First of all, you need to be clear that drones only are better in suburbs, in okay. urban areas. So big cities. Okay. then the delivery only needs to travel less than a mile, probably a half a mile. If you think I London see. or Paris or any places or San Francisco, New okay. York, drones will never, you know, they, they'll be better, but they're not better enough in those cases. Think mm -hmm. about suburbs. And in a suburb, you don't have the supply density and the demand density that, that are required for batching to work, right? So batching is the process where delivery companies, the, the delivery driver will bring two or three products at a time to two or three different addresses and they'll get, you know, two, three, four, five even deliveries per hour out of that one person. And that's great. But the average delivery time then is between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on the size of the suburb, right? So you cannot deliver a burgers and fries and, and have a high quality experience in anything over five minutes. It just doesn't work. So the quality, you can't deliver coffee mm -hmm. beyond that as well. So you really need to think that suburbs are different and mm -hmm. from two different ways. One, uh, the distances are further in suburbs and they will be in urban settings. And, mm -hmm. and batching is impossible to make work in suburbs without hugely sacrificing quality and therefore customer satisfaction in the form of NPS. Interesting, interesting. And this is just a question like for both of you guys, I guess. Do you not see then... Um, drones being used in the cosmopolitan and urban areas, basically for no. deliveries. No, no, they won't be. Um, okay. and there's, two, there's a couple of reasons. Well, there's yeah. actually three main ones. First one, physically, we okay. we hover at about sixty feet and we winch the product down to the ground. So okay. the customer needs to have a flat space on which right. we deliver their product that they can access. So if you're living in Singapore, for example, yeah. with lots of tall buildings. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. There's nowhere for us to leave the product. Um, that's the first one. Second one, laws of physics come into play, and it's very difficult for a small aircraft to fly beside a tall building because of the wind patterns. And that's mm -hmm. just a, a simple law of physics. And then the third one, more pragmatically, um, ground-based electric bicycles or scooters 
are mm. very good in urban centers where the distances are very small. Mm. And so our, the, the problem we're solving, by the way, isn't a consumer problem. It's a great mm. consumer experience as our consumers of the product, but that's mm. not the problem we're solving. The problem we're solving is right. profitability of delivery in last mile scenarios and suburbs, right? So you need to think not about the customer, you need yeah. to think about the vendor and the producer. So mm. the restaurant, the convenience store, the coffee shop, mm. those guys are paying now 30 plus, sometimes 40% of the basket value in mm. commissions just, just to pay the delivery driver in the car. So it's that problem we're actually solving. That's the primary problem we're solving is one of scalability and cost of using humans for delivery. So uh, I agree everything which is uh, about what you said, Bobby. Uh, I think most urban areas won't won't be suitable here. But I'm thinking of use cases like Miami, for example. I, I know I know you you love Miami as well, uh, and it is a place where it's it's, it's kind of like an American Venice, right? It's surrounded by a lot of water. There's a few bridges, but the traffic problem is quite quite. Um, yeah. awful, right? You know, to get from the islands to downtown or Brickell, it's a real big problem um, for motorbikes and, and cars. So, you know, I've, I've seen a few drone startups that are looking at, for example, Miami as a use case and kind of bypassing those those bridges where the traffic is essentially blocked uh, in, in rush yeah. hour. Um, so I, I wonder if, if you see any specific big cities like Miami that might offer a configuration that could be the market yeah. for you? But yeah, I mean, it's not a black and white, right? So there are very mm -hmm. large cities that, even though they're gigantic cities with 10, 20 million people and very dense, they actually live in quite flat buildings and they're very accessible by us. It, it's kind of a case by case basis. If you look at Miami, it's surrounded by massive suburbs that are easy for us to deliver to. The only place in Miami we won't be delivering to is downtown Miami, where the tall buildings are. Everywhere else, 100%, we will be there. Same for San Francisco. I mean, I say we won't work in San Francisco, but it's only the central part of the city that we won't work in. All of the suburbs in the surrounding area, we fully expect to be operating in. So, you know, maybe I oversimplified there in the initial mm. uh, comment. So, so don't be too worried. You will be getting it in Miami, just not if you live in the center in a very tall building. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just kind of um, like the, the focus on suburbs, right? And the focus, I mean, is there a reason why we're not also talking about, say, rural areas? I know like other companies like Zipline or doing like stuff in Rwanda or they're getting rural areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's also like a, a potential market, right? It can be suburb, suburbs or rural. No, I don't think rural is a, it's a viable okay. uh, area for what I would say is non-critical, low value products. So, okay. so we're focusing on uh, what I say, non-critical, meaning not life saving okay. uh, and, and low value. And the reason I say that is when it is life saving, like what Zipline are doing in Africa, they're mm -hmm. subsidized, right? The government are paying for those deliveries I see. and, okay. and there's, cool. other, there's other subsidies sure. and that's a great, you know, cause it's a fantastic thing to do, but it's a social service. It's not a business, right? I see, I see. I see. We need to be able to make money on a per flight basis. And in order to do that, you need a certain critical mass of demand. You need a certain number of flights a day, and you need a certain level of utilization of your aircraft. Yeah. And one of our aircraft does 75 deliveries a day. They're highly productive mm. machines. And that's what makes the economics work. Mm. If, if I were to share the numbers, which are just some examples, yeah. In pharmacy, in terms of prescription delivery, everyone assumes that prescription delivery would be a great business. But the, the average number of times an adult orders prescription delivery is twice a year, right? So that ain't right. a business, right? That is just never going to be a business. What yeah. is a business is cappuccino because mm -hmm. every adult buys coffee pretty much every day. There's a high degree of repeat rates of adoption rates and so on. So therefore that underpins a critical level of demand that a business like ours needs. Now, once we have that ubiquitous and every community has that, there's nothing to say then why wouldn't we do just prescription delivery as well? Of course we will, mm. but you don't build a business on those use cases. You build a business on pervasive, yeah. high adoption, high frequency items. And that drives the requirement to focus on unit economics and have automation fully on all your flights so there's no people involved. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I was just wondering, basically, that, you know, like you said, that it's going to be for suburbs, right? And what does that kind of feature look like? I'm seeing some of the other post-COVID tech trends where, you know, more people are sort of working from home, right? Um, mm -hmm. I live in London. I know a lot of my colleagues who just left the city and just moved to the suburbs, right? You know, better houses, bigger houses, and paying much less, right? Yeah. Um, and that sort of galvanizes the local economy, you know, in these smaller suburbs, which were losing a lot of money as a result of urbanization happening. So your local coffee person, your local coffee shop, your local kind of grocer, your local farmer's market, you know, a lot of stuff. So do you see like this is all pointing towards a more decentralized sort of world where you're not relying on a few cities, you know, to generate most of your economic output or even have people there. I can live, you know, in the suburbs, like um, well outside of London or, or the major cities and, and still kind of enjoy the same quality of life, basically, as someone, you know, who would in the urban areas, right? And it can be only good for nation states because we're generating um, economic and GDP growth in a decentralized way versus focus on something, a specific place, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're improving suburban living. And yeah. I mean, sub suburban living is growing anyway. More people are living yeah. there. But a big, big part of the reason I created this business is I live in a suburb in Dublin. There's 38,000 people in the suburb and it takes an hour for food delivery to arrive in my house. It's just terrible experience because it's really hard to make delivery work and yeah so the local the local coffee shop for example yeah. the last town we operated in we doubled their average basket value and essentially Amazing. doubled their business because everyone that's living at home in the suburbs and that are working in their houses they're ordering every day and mm. instead of ordering one coffee for one person they're ordering 2.3 beverages and pastries and everything else and it's so easy for them. So, so we 100% improve those businesses and suburban communities will thrive if they have this infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's quite interesting. Um, just to get a few interesting points out of the way that the listeners want to understand. So how big is your payload that you can carry and what do you do in like adverse weather conditions where, you know, <laughs> drones can't run yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Well, so the cargo bay is 3.5 kilos, which is about okay. eight pounds, just shy of eight pounds. Okay. And in terms of volume and space, it's eight gallons of volume or okay. 30 liters. So think okay. of a single grocery basket or a meal for four people, a takeaway okay. meal for four people. So more than enough. Okay. And, and in terms of weather, we fly 97% of Irish weather. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knows anything about Ireland, that means that we can fly in any weather anywhere else because um, the weather here is terrible. We have rain every day. In July, we'd rain every single day and we had mm -hmm. strong winds and we fly on the coast, uh, west coast of Europe. So we can fly in 45 kilometer an hour winds and any amount of rain. So therefore, we won't be shut down by weather, actually. We're not like okay. typical drones. They're aerospace grade drones. They're designed for strong weather yeah and did you say it um the velocities are like 100 kilometer an hour is that yeah airspeed is just oh, airspeed. about 110 kilometers an hour airspeed That's and fast. we'll maintain a ground speed yeah it yeah. is yeah but we, you, i mean you need it as i said if we're flying in 40 45 mile an hour winds therefore you're only getting effectively 60 kilometer an hour as the you know ground speed so that's the calculation you need to make. And that takes a lot of energy. That's actually the hardest problem to solve um, with drones because of the amount of energy it takes to fly at that airspeed. But we have solved that and we've been flying that for three years. So um, the customer experience, we, we think three minutes is the is the mm. time we should target. And it's not because the customer is not willing to wait five minutes. They are. But for certain categories like coffee, hot food, you mm. know, so on, uh, three minutes is 100 times better than five minutes. And so that's what we do. So, Bobby, uh, I think this this um, vehicle performance issue, uh, you know, your range and your, your your payload capacity and your speed that you pointed, and the adverse weather is, I think, very very important not just for the whole industry but for you as well, right? Because I recently heard that you're um, you know going to market in Texas, um, and of course Texas is a totally different um, you know weather ecosystem than than ireland right you, you know you, i was back in austin 
uh, back in May, and it was all, already like 37, 38 degrees um, in noon. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, density altitude is pretty high. You know, aircraft are uh, struggling to fly. Um, so I, I wonder, uh, how are you thinking about, maybe you can give us, uh, how you know, your, yeah. your plans for Texas and how you're launching and what do you think mm -hmm. will be the challenges there and, um, and the opportunities? Yeah, uh, you're right to point that out. Um, heat is much harder to, high temperatures are much harder to handle than cold. Cold is easy. Um, just requires a little bit of extra energy to keep maintain mm -hmm. your batteries at a constant temperature. Batteries are a chemical equation, and this is the reason heat is a problem, either too much or not enough, is mm -hmm. the battery chemistry is only efficient between 10C and about 42C. So they're an optimally, it depends on the battery chemistry, but usually you want to be at about 26, 27 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And so there's either active heating or, or passive cooling usually. So active heating is where you apply extra energy to keep your battery at a constant temperature and active active cooling is where you just use airflow across a well-designed aircraft to keep your uh, your components but mainly your battery at the right temperature so there's a number of advantages that we have there primarily we don't leave the battery in the aircraft we hot swap so every flight goes out with a new battery so the battery is cycled in and out so we charge indoors at a constant temperature and the battery is only flying for a round trip of about six minutes so we have a natural advantage by just an our aircraft architecture where we don't have to swap the battery. Um, so again, all, all that's all. We, we think we're within range of Texas temperatures. We wouldn't have gone to uh, Dallas area if we didn't think we were. So that's not that hard a problem to solve. Now, we, we, we wouldn't be going to Phoenix, Arizona yet, uh, or certain areas of the Middle East, but most areas we believe uh, were good. The other area, um, you mentioned actually about altitude, for example, you know, I lived in Mexico City for three years. It's seven and a half thousand feet above sea level. There's an easy calculation to make around altitude and barometric pressure um, that, that we know about. And the result is not that you can't operate, it's that you reduce the range or the speed that you operate at. So your aircraft is about at 7,000 feet above sea level, you're about 20% loss of efficiency. And that means that you're flying either 20% less or you're clipping the wind, the wind speed that you're allowed to fly in or you're willing to fly in. So these are not difficult equations to calculate. And, and all of that is built in dynamic route calculation that we have for the aircraft. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I was going to say, like, if you're talking about suburbs, right, and if you're trying to go after like the largest single domestic market in the world, the US is just the right um, place to do <laughs> yeah. so, right? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be, it's interesting. And did you say the hot swaps are like manually someone swapping batteries or like, is that like automatic? We actually oh. have a robotic hot okay. swap. Um, so it's a robot arm that uses computer vision to find the aircraft when it lands and change the battery, but it's actually slower than a human doing it. So. Our turnaround time with a human is 30 seconds. It's a minute okay. and 30 seconds with a robot. We can speed that up, uh, but it's still never going to beat a human. And one of our humans can do 20 turnarounds an hour. So we're not that motivated to not use the human in this case. Um, okay. So yeah, may, maybe at some point in the future, we will have fully automated hot swaps. But for now, we're very happy to use people to do that. It's an easy part of the uh, process and it doesn't slow us down or reduce the productivity of the aircraft. Yeah, so uh, I think let, let's return back to the Texas go to market, which is, I think, really, really exciting for everybody, really. You know, uh, I was reading recently that Alphabet, uh, Alphabet's wing is, you know, experimenting in Little Lamb and Frisco, Texas. Flytrax yeah. is in Granbury, Amazon Prime Air, uh, you know, is in College Station, and now Mana, you will be going and testing and operating there. Can you can yeah. you talk about how, you know, you know, you'll be experimenting and where you'll be launching and what kind of operations can can Texans yeah. and Dallas people can can expect? We'd love to hear that. Yeah, we're incredibly excited about. The U.S. operation. It's it's been a long time coming for us, but we've held back from the U.S. simply because the regulatory environment hasn't been there to permit 
what we're doing. You know, I know Wing and, and Amazon, they've all been in the US as of others. But in essence, we didn't want to spend time in the US until the US was ready. And we only feel that really now the US has come of age in terms of the FAA's willingness to license BB loss operations through Part 135 or Part 108 operations. So, and we already have, just to be clear, a European wide BB loss license. So we have, you know, a very mature regulatory framework in, in Europe, which we wanted to take advantage of to grow and to, and to learn as much as we could before we scale. What Texas means to us is it's kind of a, it's, it's almost a statement of intent from us that we're not a European drone delivery business, we're a USA drone delivery business that happens to be in Europe at the moment. And we have absolutely every intention of being the leader in the USA. And Dallas is just our first little baby step in that regard. It's still a year or two years away, we think, before the FAA will be issuing widespread drone delivery licenses. Um, but we'll certainly have enough, we think, for the early parts of our scale in 24 and 25 that we'd be very happy to do. So for the, the folks in Dallas, we're operating initially in, in with the Alliance Texas real estate business. Um, and in there, uh, they have a community of 27,000 acres of beautiful detached suburban homes. I'm jealous of them myself. And we'll be delivering everything that we deliver uh, here. We'll be delivering from all the local vendors. We'll be bringing in some innovative new vendors as well from local communities that want to make ice cream or milkshakes or sell hardware, whatever it is they want to sell. But literally, every, we'd expect every vendor in the local community to work with us as they, as they do in Ireland today. And of course, we'd be bringing in our existing brand partnerships that we have with Ben & Jerry's, with Samsung, with Coca-Cola and a number of other brand partnerships. And then we haven't announced them yet, but we have some other major well-known US brands that we have partnerships with that we haven't announced that those uh, residents will be able to avail of as well. So think pretty much all of your uh, beverage and food needs will be catered for and a couple of other uh, novel uh, new drone delivery ideas. So when do you think we'll see Texas barbecue being delivered by Mana? I think that would be huge Texan, Texan thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, for me, it's Tex-Mex because I lived in Mexico for three years and Tex and, and Texans oh, do Mexican better than the Mexicans do. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, so I want to know. my mouth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thinking about it. Um, so, like, I'm just so excited. Like, when I went, I was there a couple of weeks ago and, and our our partners there are the, are, uh, the folks from uh, Lions Texas and they, they're an aviation business. They have an airport that they own there. That would be our HQ. And I got to, I had the pleasure of flying over the whole area in a, in a helicopter to see the space where we're going to be delivering. And there's something about just flying over the space in the Bell 307 that just, you really see the potential of it. And as we all know, the, the, the American consumer and the American market is by far the biggest market in the world for something like this. It dwarfs everywhere else. Even though Europe has 500 million people, the, the actual consumer is a much less uh, consumer-y consumer, if you will, than the US mm. one is. So US is 100% our, our number one key target market. Um, but we will, we do plan to be a winner in Europe as well, but the US consumer, and it's just such a great market and we're so excited about it. It's really interesting, you know, looking at wider Texas. Um, I was in Austin for like two days in May, but then I decided to stay for 10, 10 more days um, because of the environment and the, the startups and the investors. Yeah. It's just such a Elon Musk is there, you know, um, and yeah. Joe Rogan is there, right? So, um, you know, what I found in Austin is that it's a consumer startup heaven. Wherever you mm. look at, where, whichever pitch competition that you go to, or, or tech stars event or capital factory event, there is a consumer business focused on beverages or alcohol or or new forms of food. Um, so it's it's quite interesting that everything that's that you know not just the infrastructure and the aviation infrastructure, but also the startup ecosystem seems to line up with um, what you're going after. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, people ask me why do we choose Texas. And it honestly wasn't 
I mean, all the drone delivery companies are in Texas, but we didn't choose it because all the other drone delivery companies are there. But that, that's a benefit, actually, because ultimately we all have to work together and we have to prove that we can share the airspace. So if you really think what's the right reason we're all in Texas, it's because we all need to share the airspace. So now is the time where we start integrating our UTMs and talking to each other, showing the FAA how we can cooperate and share the airspace. So we ultimately this is the right time for us all to be in the same place. Um, and then, you know, by, really it's kind of serendipity that we found the Alliance Texas folks or they found us and they've got all these beautiful homes that they've built and are building and, and they want to bring state-of-the-art technology to, their, to the purchasers or the renters of their homes. And if you think about it, if you're buying a new house, you're, you're moving to an area, you're selecting where to live, Drone delivery is one hell of a draw to that community. It's a very exciting thing to put on a brochure for a house. So uh, I, I think the the way Texans do business, they're business friendly. There's no bureaucracy gets in your way. If you want to do business, you're going to be warmly received in the state and in, in most cities in the state. So it just resonates for us as a as a startup, uh, technology startup, particularly that we're welcome both by the community that we're flying in, but by the state that sees technology and technology jobs as very, very important part of their future. Perfect. I, I totally agree. Texas is quite, quite up and coming and amazing. Um, so let's let's move to the macro scale a little bit. I just want to, you know, have your understanding around how you're approaching the current state of the market as an operator. Um, you know, back in 2013. Jeff Bezos famously said that in, in five years or so, we're going to have Amazon primary deliveries all over the country, right? Which obviously hasn't happened, especially fast forwarding 10 years from 2013, which is where we're at today. So I, I wonder, um, first of all, why hasn't that happened? And how can we convince the, the wide world that this is actually the time that it is happening? Um, mm. And would love to find out, especially since we're in a bear market today, how you're approaching actual rolling out and raising capital and, and really making it happen 10 years after what Bezos yeah. said. I'll answer the second question first. Um, yes, the capital markets are very tough uh, for private companies to raise. Um, we've seen recently Zipline raising 300 million plus on a very punchy valuation. I was delighted to see that. But but aside from that, the capital markets are in a bad place and, and and risk is not a good word at the moment. However, good businesses get funding and businesses particularly with rational unit economics are easy to fund. And in our case, we already have profitable unit economics. We can show as we scale the number is a positive number, not a negative number. Um, a basic focus on the fundamentals of running a business and not to be excited about toys, which drones can be interpreted as. So we're, we're a very sober management team that have run large businesses before. We understand economics uh, that make sense and economics that don't make sense. So while we are a technology company, we are a prudent, well-run technology company that knows not to scale and burn investors' money uh, on negative unit economics. And that's what we've been building for five years. And, and I'm delighted to say we're now profitable at the flight level. And each individual each individual location we would open up will make money. So that's an unusual place for a drone delivery business. I don't think anyone else could say that. So we're very bullish about our, our prospects for fundraising. A quick follow up. Is, sorry, a quick follow up yeah. on that. I think this is very, very important because, you know, before um, the, you know, post-COVID boom for 2021, um, you know, it pro scalability of the company uh, across tech was really important, right? You know, venture mm -hmm. capitals, you know, uh, funded companies and grow and grow and grow no matter the cost. And now everybody's talking about profit profitability. How are you approaching this, this dance between um, scale and profitability today? Yeah, it's, it's funny. The, the business we're building, you can't scale until you're safe, right? So most people, we don't talk about that. We, we It's an assumption. It's kind of, a, it's it's table stakes, right? For drone delivery. And safety takes a long time to put in place. And it's not 
you don't design a system that's safe and then it will just be safe. You have to iterate through a lot of mistakes, a lot of learnings, and, and you build them in and you iterate, iterate, test, test, test. Crawl, walk, run. I'm sure you've heard of that phrase in, mm-hmm. in aviation. It takes a long time. And so you don't get to scale, even if you have unlimited money and you don't care about some negative economics or burn a bit of cash. You can't start scaling until you're ready. And, and ready doesn't mean well capitalized. Ready means having a product that's safe to scale. And so that takes a long time. So we haven't had the desire or the need to create a lot of volume. And we don't create a lot. Like we're doing 300 deliveries a day now. we will be doing about 1,000 deliveries a day in our new location. This is small volume. DoorDash do 2 billion orders a year. So we're mm-hmm. not scaling. And we don't want to. We're focused on two things, delivering a safe platform that we know we could do a million flights a day when we do scale and, and we're not going to cause any problems. And and each flight makes money, right? So we're now at mm. both of those stages. We now have a safe platform. It's certified in Europe. We know our economics are solid. We'll do even better in economics, but we're at the point now where we have scalable economics. So it's only really now that we've reached the point where Scaling is a valid thing to do. And I only know one other company that's in that place, and that's Google Wing. Um, mm. They're really the only ones that we believe are in, a, in the right place with safety in terms of sa- scaling safely and doing it in a way that's fully automated. And, I guess, and so uh, you, you kind of yeah. re- you're forced to go slow because of safety and being ready for that. And that works well. I guess for the founders listening, one thing if you're building a company in this economy is that uh, you can't afford to not be unit economics safe. It's fine to be um, at a loss, at a net loss, at a balance sheet level, right? But at a unit level, you got to be profitable or break. Correct. Right. So that's what you got to optimize for. Um, And I think there's a huge distinction there. uh, Like you said, Pamir, that pre COVID, It was all about, okay, it doesn't matter the unit economics or the balance sheet economics. You just kind of um, growth, growth, growth. Grow, right? grow, grow, grow. Yeah. That doesn't the, doesn't yeah. apply anymore. And exactly. to be honest, it, it never would have applied in our space anyway. But I, I just would, a slight difference, yeah. which you said, it's, it's, you need, you either need positive unit economics on a, you yeah. know, standstill basis. So in other words, currently, or yeah. you need a, a trajectory to that, right? So if you can right, say okay. confidently okay. that with scale comes better, we're, we're mm-hmm. at the first, right? We're profitable with no scale, right? On a, okay. on a per flight basis. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's perfectly valid for the founders that are listening to say, look, we're losing money per, per, per whatever it is, our unit of work okay. now. But if we bought a million of these things, we get it for this price and therefore we make money. That's fine as well. You just need clarity and certainty on it. But you're right to say that yeah. there's, there's it's very hard to get a business funded if you can't confidently say yeah. that you're going to get the positive unit economics and and almost if you wanted to to reach profitability across the business yeah. if you did enough scale you'd need to be able to say that just out of curiosity um so do you guys like charge the vendors and charge the customer as well is that your revenue source or we have different models so we have some models with some vendors where it's purely for okay. delivery charges and we have some where we charge the consumer a delivery charge. And then we have some where we charge both the vendor and the consumer. So we have a mix of them. It depends on the channel we're selling through. Interesting. Quite interesting. Quite interesting. Um, I wanted to ask something, and, and you know about this, that you can't have a podcast these days without talking about AI and Gen AI uh, in your product roadmap, if it's not there already. But um Curious to know, like I'm sure you've used some 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 AI stuff in there. Can you tell us what those are, and specifically, are you guys or do you guys plan to use LLMs, large language <laughs> models, <laughs> and superconductors <laughs> as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, whatever. So yeah. so uh, firstly, in, in aviation, and to have a certifiable platform. AI is not great, right? Because it's non-deterministic. It's very difficult to prove scientifically that with this input comes this output because that's not the case, right? Particularly with LLMs, it's not. Um, but even, even with computer vision or any of these other technologies, 
that are based on, you know, recurrent neural networks or deep learning of some sort to, to recognize patterns. And um, they're all great and they all work brilliantly. But if they're if they're involved in the critical operation of your flight, you're never going to get an airline or an aviation regulator to approve them because they don't know how to. Um, so, yes, we have computer vision on the aircraft and that is used for safety reasons. Right. So we'll use sensors to know when we're when we deliver, right, we hover about 60 to 90 mm -hmm. feet, depending on where over your house and we winch the product down to the ground and we will use sensors there to do two things one is to detect as an altimeter right a very accurate altimeter because we really need to be accurate for delivery and we'll also use it to make sure that there's no little people or little dogs underneath the uh, underneath the delivery area we won't deliver if there's a person there and so we use we use computer vision for that and we have a combination of lidar and sensors and there's all sorts of approaches to it, right but ultimately the software stack is computer vision and that's fine to use that because it's not critical to flight and if we get that wrong the worst thing is someone gets a hamburger on the head and it's <laughs> not going to injure them at least there's yeah. not enough kinetic energy to, to be a real safety incident but the key thing is you can't really use that type of technology for flight critical operations you can use it for operations just not flight critical so that's the first point and then our other use of it is funnily enough when we open a new area we send an aircraft like a cessna over the air and we'll scan the whole area with lidar high resolution lidar and that is what we need to map an area so to count the house to know where all the gardens are to look for obstacles you know big tall obstacles that we need to navigate around cables all those kind of things we do that scan once and that gives us a high resolution lidar view of the place and we do use a lot of uh, you know machine learning techniques to identify what's underneath us but that, it's all vanilla stuff there's no we're not waymo our job is actually the drone delivery is a very easy technology problem to solve the hard part of it isn't you know things like ai it's reliability and safety maintainability all of those boring things around safety that's the hard part and then in terms of llms i mean I, we use them for writing code <laughs> that's the right, real right. use of, of llms yeah. i mean for yeah. checking code writing Co code oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 oh so unreal. I, I mean i use chat GPT myself i write a lot of code still yeah. i love it um, for for side projects but uh, so so no we're, not right now is the answer now llms will be able to be used for some of our use cases but for now we, you know our conversation is with regulators aviation regulators mm -hmm. and you just cannot bring a black box with yeah. non-deterministic outputs to an aviation regulator and and fairly ask them to approve yeah. it it's just yeah 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 i think um i think that point you made about non-deterministic black box is a very important one because i think a lot of people are just you know thinking, oh, AI means it's going to be, everything's just going to be better, everything's going to be more predictable and not consistent, blah, blah, but it's actually not that, right? Um, so yeah, one thing to you know, take into account before you put in your product, it's that it's going to be non-deterministic, basically. Correct, right? correct. And so like, it's fine, as I said, it's fine to use it yeah. for, uh, you know, use cases that are not critical, but for any yeah. other use case, you know, you should avoid it. And and we didn't answer your yeah. question about Amazon yeah. and Bezos, though. I, we, we skipped by that. I always find that's an interesting one. It's more about the science of, of groups of people. I mean, Amazon are an awesome company, and, and their engineers are definitely no dumber than our engineers. They have the smartest uh, you know, people in the world and the most amount of money in the world. But sometimes it's just easier for small companies to get complicated tasks done than it is for bigger companies. That's one part of it. The second more relevant part is Amazon have always been trying to operate in the USA and the USA has been in regulatory purgatory for 10 years. Nobody has been able to make progress there. It's not just Amazon. And the fact is Amazon have a fine aircraft. It's an, it's an awesome bit of engineering. It's quite unique. Um, it doesn't, it's not what we need for our, for our needs, but Amazon have had a very different problem they've had to solve, which is long range rural drone delivery. 
and that's a harder problem to solve with a copter. So I don't think they've done a bad job. In fact, I think they've done a really amazing job. But the reason they're not out there and operating is because the regulatory environment in the USA hasn't supported them to be able to do that. And they've been solely focused on on making progress in the USA market. And that's simply why. I mean, look at Wing in, in Australia doing 20,000 deliveries a month. Um, if Amazon had gone to Australia, they'd probably be very, very successful in Australia. But they just are focused on the US market for now. And I think that's largely the reason that they they haven't made enough progress. So do you think, Bobby, you know, you mentioned FAA's Part 108 regulation that is being written right now. Um, and just for our audience, what Part 108 will enable uh, in the U.S. is this wide-scale, long-range flights where you will be able to fly perhaps, um, you know, five, ten drones or 20 drones to a single pilot um, without having observers all around uh, along that route, right? So uh, I want to understand from your perspective, do you think part 108 is the watershed moment for our industry, especially in the US? Yeah. And do you think um, if, if that gets delayed and usually, you know, things get delayed in aviation, you know, if they say two years, you can assume it's five years, six years, right? Uh, hopefully not. Do you, will you need Part 108 to come out to scale it to the United States, or do you, are there other regulatory pathways that you can leverage here? Yeah, I think there are. Like we're very hopeful about Part 108, but we're we're not very hopeful about the timeline. We we think it's probably two or three years away, um, but it is the answer to what everyone needs. And it feels like the 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 current kind of pace and time of it is that it's two or three years. We might be wrong on that. We're open. We're, we're We'd be delighted if we were wrong on that, actually. But if I had to bet, that's the timeline, I would say. But I think there's a key unlock to scale drone delivery that can happen before 108 happens. And that's more around airspace management and specifically UTM and, and coordinated UTMs. UTM, for, for your listeners, is an unmanned traffic management system. Um, it's what we use to, to, to open or, or, should I say, allocate the airspace for our own flights it's standards based there's a standard for for utms and there's many utm providers of which both wing and amazon are utm providers so that allows us to allocate the airspace in a very granular way and more importantly we could for example operate in the same location as wing or amazon we could connect our utms up to each other and safely avoid each other in the airspace and, and that's actually yeah. yeah that's that's the unlock. So we have part 135, which is perfectly fine for licensing the entity in an operational way. And then the means of compliance for detect and avoid, as it's called, to be able to detect other aircraft. We think that the pragmatic solution is the same thing that's happened in Europe, which is coordinated UTMs uh, that allow to deconflict traffic before it flies. And, and we would definitely be in agreement with our colleagues in Wing and Amazon, Zipline, Flytrex, all of us would agree on this, that the way to safely share the airspace is through UTM connections. And if the FAA agree that, that's the final barrier really to scale BV loss drone delivery. And again, BV loss to be technical is beyond visual line of sight. It doesn't necessarily mean beyond visual line of sight. It means, as you said, multiple aircraft per person and in ireland now we can operate 20 aircraft for one person oh really and that's wow. yeah and that's because Amazing. of the license that we have and we do that through coordinated utms it's in, in europe it's called u space that's the term the collective set of services that allow us to integrate with general aviation and to allow our utms connect to each other so it's pragmatic it's elegant it's safe and i think and I pray that the USA will go that direction too. And we're all cooperating, all of the companies, competitors, you might call us, but we are all talking to each other and we all agree that the way forward is that cooperative detection and avoidance. And, and that is safe, it's scalable, and that is the answer to scale drone delivery for the USA. So, you know, just from a layman's perspective, because I'm not an expert in this field, um, you talked about safety and security uh, when it comes to drones. I guess this is, you know, like a, a very important thing for any new adoption of technology that people are going to have to 
understand and trust, build high trust in the tech before you know they start doing anything else, right? Um, so, so you said that UTM um, makes drones avoid each other so that you know they're not crashing into each other. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other things people also think about is that okay, cool if you've got delivery drones going over my house, over my backyard, blah, blah, blah. Is that going to be a, a violation of my privacy or, or yada, yada? Um, so how do, how do you guys tackle yeah. and, and, and understand that, you know, like in terms of privacy as well as um, other regulations that's, that's there? Yeah, that's that's a common one. So, so if, if you ask people, if you survey people, what, you know, yeah. apart from the positives, what do you think are the negatives about drone delivery? The first thing they say is noise. Yeah. Second one is privacy. Sometimes they alternate, but noise and privacy are the top two. Then mm-hmm. the third one they say is job loss. And the fourth one is safety. Yes. And actually yeah. the only one that's valid is safety, right? And um, mm-hmm. they don't think, they assume safety, right? So noise is easy. We, I mean, we've got 150,000 flights now, handful of complaints. Wing uh, do 20,000 deliveries, 10 to 20,000 deliveries a month, five or six complaints a month. Noise is not an issue. Uh, it's a perceived one, but once people experience the actual yeah. service, because these it's are electric, not an issue. Right? It's an yeah. electric. Yeah. So, I mean, They're electric, electric but like yeah. small drones make a lot of noise. Uh, yeah. okay. Our drones sure. don't. Like Wing have solved it in a different way than we have. We've solved it through large props with a special design. Wing yeah. have solved it through very clever engineering with small props, but, but we get no complaints. So noise is not an issue. Privacy is a perception problem, mm. right? It's not a real... It, People don't really, you know, of course they're worried about privacy, but there's no reason to be. But it's our job to make them feel safe, to communicate well with them and to respect their privacy, right? So what that translates to is no recording, no information, no customer knowledge, nothing looking down that can invade their privacy, absolutely zero. And mm. to be to say that, to be clear about it, to be true to our word, because we're, we're not an information business, we're a logistics business, that's what we do. Mm. So having customer data or taking video of their house or pictures of them or anything like that is just not, it's never going to be okay to do that. And if we have the permission of a community to fly in their community, not everyone is going to be our customer. We need to be respectful of the people we fly over. And, and I think that's easy to achieve. We just need to be, do that. You guys have cameras on your drones. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So we have, we have, we have, twin cameras so that computer vision stuff i mentioned earlier on we have two stereoscopic cameras and they're used for altimeter and checking that the area is flat but it's all done with the computer right so none of it leaves the aircraft you have to have that for safety uh but it's not for uh looking into someone's garden and then the alternative course is road-based delivery driver that rocks right up to your house knocks on the door and all of that Mm. so look we're respectful of privacy and there there is not an issue there there's potential you know with with a, with a positive nod towards our friends at Google and Amazon, right? There, there's an unfair categorization of these big tech companies as bad, you know, because whatever. But they're not. They're these these guys are just as good as the independent companies like us are. They know what's important here, and privacy is not it's not negotiable when you're flying over populated areas. So I think we're good there. Uh, there's still perception, of course, people will think about it, but there's there's no. Uh, violations of privacy would be tolerated by any of us. That makes sense. And uh, just coming to the job loss part. So obviously we clarified that this is not going to be for urban areas. So your delivery driver is still kind of safe for now for I don't know, robots come in, she can walk the roads or something like that. Um, so what about other job loss? Are you replacing, I guess, drivers in uh, yeah. the suburbs then is that yeah doing? like we're we're, we're going to displace those jobs not kill them yeah. um so the way to think about that is if you if you enable an infrastructure like this to local business you're creating jobs in those businesses right whether they're restaurants or bookshops or small vendors making whatever you're creating you're protecting jobs and you're creating jobs by increased consumption and so we know that we're bringing jobs to the community and in certainly in a suburban cu- community, there aren't many delivery drivers anyway. They're low paid jobs, they're dangerous jobs, they're thankless jobs. And those people can work very, very happily in the many, many small businesses that we're going to empower 
to have more and more customers. So we don't think that if anything, we're going to grow the local economy, not not to, you know not shrink it. And that means when, like anything, when an economy grows, jobs get created and better jobs. So we're very proud to do that job displacement. Um, we don't love the the job of of driving around in a motorbike for our sons and daughters, uh, carrying hamburgers around busy roads. Um, so, so net net, we're confident that we'll create jobs. Yeah, yeah, That's I amazing. think of it. It's yeah. like this that um, yeah, just to kind of wrap on this point before we kind of move to the next topic. But it's like this that um, if you're doing currently like a trucker or like doing these delivery jobs, you know, just going and uh, delivering stuff over long distances and stuff like that. These sort of equalizing technologies like the internet, you know, which is very democratized, available to everybody, uh, drone delivery in a way very soon where it's like literally whatever vendor you are, local entrepreneur, you know, you are, it's accessible and you can ship your products, you know, quite fast mm -hmm. there, right? Um, you'll be kind of galvanizing and, and starting getting people to boost their entrepreneurship skills, you know, and grow yeah. more businesses. And, and, and those, the same person would otherwise go out and do, you know, the delivery jobs is now going to add an extra person into the labor force because, you know, they need to make more hot food for some, some, something like yeah. that. So I mean, uh, I'll yeah. give it, can I give you an yeah. example of that, that I yeah, yeah. really love? We, we've yeah. got these two young kids They're I think they're 19, 20 years old and they make milkshakes, right? They've, they've created their own little business. They're straight out of school, mm. high school, you call it in America. And, and they're working, you know, making milkshakes and they're lovely milkshakes. They're, you know, a million calories in each one, but they're delicious, really great milkshakes. They made their own little brand. These are kids straight out of school and they're in our system and they're one of our biggest vendors. And they can now reach in you know, our new town is 120,000 people in it and 39,000 homes. And yeah. they're just making milkshakes on our roof. That's two jobs we've created. Those guys are doing really, really well. It's a small yeah. example, but it's a great way to think about it because in yeah. the end, we're just giving anyone who wants it an infrastructure that they can use to reach exactly. 100, 200,000 customers. I mean, that means every single business is automatically an online business with, with exactly. robotic logistics. Exactly. Flying yep. milkshakes. I wouldn't have never thought that's, that's really cool. Yeah. It just <laughs> yeah. doesn't last. It, it's it's, it's, it's yeah. our second most, second most important product after hot coffee is those guys and their milkshakes. Wow. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, you're also reaching that demographic, Bobby. I think you're one of the few entrepreneurs in this space, in aerospace, um, where it's usually, you know, more corporate, maybe older, older folks that are founding companies, but you, you seem to really have this um, approachable and, and friendly approach. And I, I guess this is one of the reasons why those two um, young entrepreneurs uh, are actually in your system, right? So uh, I think that's really, really cool. And maybe we can shift the conversation into um, you as an entrepreneur. Um, what I really wonder here is because you come from a really software background. Um, yeah. and you found it, was it three businesses, four, four businesses? This is my sixth business. Six yeah. business. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's quite amazing. Incredible. Um, could you, could you tell us how you, how that shift from software focused product into something much more hardware and capital intensive and operations yeah. intensive, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you manage teams. What are the specific challenges here that you're managing and how your software mm -hmm. Um, experience is is transferring to that success yeah that's a great question um and i don't really know the answer uh but i'll do my best um one of the things about me i'm a programmer firstly so therefore it's natural for me to build software teams and software products mm. and with a particular focus on SaaS and travel technology and then i'm find myself in a drone delivery business which is 50 percent hardware 50 percent software and another 50 percent mm. regulatory uh it's really really difficult but the common thread across all the businesses that i've built other than the first one where i was kind of a solopreneur um is it's a it's about hiring great people and not i won't say leading them but joining them up as a team to work together be aligned together be in love with the mission together work your asses off you know work well and smart, pragmatically, make commercially focused 
strategies around your architecture, you know, not be wasteful of resources, I would say. Uh, and that's a common thread, whether it's software or hardware, whether it's aviation or, or mobile phones, it doesn't matter. The, the, the hard part of, I think, building a successful result is how good you are at hiring people and how good you are at motivating them and, and making them all love working together, making them all love waking up early on Monday morning to go to work and work those weekends and those long hours that we, we need you to do if you're a startup. And I think that's a common, it doesn't matter what business you're running. In fact, arguably, you could apply that type of filter to any business that's trying to scale, but particularly technology where technology people have a lot of choices. They have a lot of projects that they could be hired to work on, a lot of interesting work that they can learn in and be passionate about. So there's a lot of competition for those people. And I think it, it helps to choose something as exciting as drone delivery to work on, but that in itself isn't enough. People need to be learning on the job. They need to be building their careers. They need to be getting better. They need to be inspired by really smart technology people. All of those ingredients are what makes a, a team successful. And that I say, I don't brag much, but if I'm good at something, that is one of the things I'm good at. And, you know, my team are probably listening to this laughing at me now, but they know they really love me secretly. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice, it's a nice place to work in. And I, and I, I'm very proud and very dedicated to making it a great place for engineers to work in. So I don't need to know anything about hardware. I just need enough to know that they're going in the right direction. And then I overlay that with fantastic, uh, you know, ex what I would say is external people or people that advise us and, and dip in and out and help us to make sure that we don't make any big mistakes in our engineering choices or our architecture choices. And those are people that, you know, help me translate important things like safety, maintainability into architectures and, and engineering and, and they kind of percolate my top level kind of things that we need in, into activity yeah. for the engineers so it, it isn't yeah. really hard uh and i think the key is the people part for yeah, I think I saw one of your tweets the other day. Actually, Premier, I think you forwarded it to me. Uh, it was um, more like uh, you want to switch from uh, bits to atoms, right? And um, yeah. how yeah. you should basically focus on that. And, and to me, it's always um, an interesting idea because um, I've interviewed a lot of GPs at VCs before on the same podcast. And when I talk to them, if they invest in, say, a mixture of you know hardware and software, like say SaaS, um, a lot of the kind of upsides of their on the, in their portfolios would be from the SaaS, you know, um, and a lot of the kind of downsides in their portfolio would be from the hardware uh, sort of investments mm -hmm. they made. Yeah. Uh, eventually, their their funds end up being net positive or, or like two to three X, you know, returning money to their GP, to the LPs. Uh, but it's the SaaS sort of stuff, which particularly makes it, you know, look nicer and stuff. So for mm -hmm. me, it's always interesting uh, to talk to folks like yourself who are in that kind of hardware software space, but also running an incredibly, you know, well operated uh, kind of hardware software shop, basically, and then making mm -hmm. it work. Um, and, 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 and I think there is a bit of like a, a challenge there uh, in terms of, okay, SaaS, um, you just build something first, you sell a million copies after, you just charge mm -hmm. a licensing fee, right? Uh, versus this one. So, like, I'm not, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like a well, question or whatever. I, yeah, it's just like a reflection. Yeah, so no, yeah. no. It's a real, yeah. So that, that tweet, yeah, uh, I remember that tweet and I had fun yeah. writing that one. And yeah. there's, two, there's, two, there's two things about that tweet. One is, it comes to me as an engineer, right? What's fun to work on and what's not? And mm. SaaS is great. And the, the mar as you say, once you write mm. the software in, in the SaaS world, your marginal cost of production is zero. Right. So it's a high yeah. margin, easy to scale business. It's a sales job, right? Yeah. So think Stripe and all those wonderful companies like Stripe. Yeah. But also think, you know, if you want to be meaningful in the world mm. and you want to be in every single home, you've got to be hardware, not software. And in this business, we want to change the world. We want to be in every single suburban home and mean something to every single person in the world that lives in a mm -hmm. suburb and every small business. And if I just name three relatively well-known companies in the hardware space, it would be Tesla, Apple, and SpaceX. 
Mm, and yeah. they are meaningful hardware companies that affect tens of millions of customers in a positive way, hundreds of millions, billions in the case of Apple, and they're mm. hardware plays, and mm. they're the most valuable companies in the world, but they're much harder. <laughs> yeah. And when you get it right, though, uh, the prize is exceptionally good. Yeah. So uh, what I like about it is it's so difficult Mm. that it won't be replicated easily. So the moat uh, is very, very good. wide, right? So sure. if you're yeah. good enough and capitalized enough to build a product that's viable with consumers, nobody is coming after you. Yeah. And just look at the moat and the momentum that Apple, mm. Tesla, SpaceX have now. Just name in three. I could, I could go on. There's loads more. Once yeah. you get the product right and you have momentum, the moat, is so so valuable so your longevity as a mm. business is very very good and ultimately uh it's horses for courses really but you know certainly if i was an investor and a conservative one i'd go SaaS. but if i was mm. an investor and wanted to change the world and have the biggest company in the world as a result of my investment i would yeah. go combination of hardware and software yeah 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 that's incredible and one of the places where I've seen the focus on atoms more than bits and bytes is actually the emerging market, you know, in a different way, mm. in a way that, um, for instance, like your basic manufacturing companies, you know, where in, in a place where nothing exists, basically, you need, you know, the usual consumer items, you know, you need, you know, build houses, you know, places to live and your furniture and your food and stuff like that. And if you if you consider those atoms as well, uh, I basically see like a lot of manufacturing sort of stuff and, and a lot of kind of entrepreneurial zeal in the emerging markets. Um, and and yeah. focus on atoms India, as well. I India, yeah. India is exactly. a huge market for drone delivery specifically, you know, I okay. mean, uh, and and the number of Indian companies that are actively building in drone delivery that contact me as well. Some of them, you know, trying to license our tech, or some of them looking for advice. And it's it's really exciting, and it's a, such a great opportunity for them yeah. all. Uh, and that's what's just what China's China's yeah. similar, but obviously different dynamics. Yeah. What's what's Mana's sort of roadmap in terms of geography? Like, do you guys want to? I mean, obviously, you just entered the, the U.S. market, three hundred million people. That's a lot, right? To scale too, but do you see like a potential of last mile drone deliveries in the emerging markets where there is a dearth of infrastructures of roads and stuff like that? Basically, um, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. We're, we're, right mm. now, we're focused on USA market number one, yeah. Europe, U USA and Europe. I would say in equal terms because yeah. you, if everything was equal, it'd be US, but everything's not. So Europe is more ready. So. Definitely Europe and and USA, and in Europe I would include the UK, and that that's a gigantic uh, project, if you will, yeah, that'll keep us yeah. busy for ten years of growth. Yeah. Um, what do you say Europe now, is more readier? By the way, sorry, out of curiosity, but the regulatory, uh, the regulatory, more regulatory. Okay. It's like we sure. have our license already, so literally we can oh, go for anywhere sure. in Europe tomorrow, hmm. scale BB loss delivery everywhere. There's literally nothing left in Europe in terms of regulatory access that we need. So, Interesting. so therefore, as an investment, if you want to start ramping up ARR and building a, some mm. cash contribution business, Europe is where to do it and US is not. But if you want to build for the biggest market in the world and the biggest homogenous market in the world, then uh, you go to the US. So those are the two that interest us the most, but it's hard to ignore you know latin america look at mexico city 25 yeah. million people look at, look at southeast asia there's no i'm not saying no to any of these markets but you can't uh take everything on at once you've got to be realistic oh yeah yeah for sure so we, we'll we'll have to cherry because don't forget remember when uber rolled out how long it took uber to roll out and, and all they were doing was hiring people on the ground and and having a car sourcing a driver yeah. sourcing system and even still that's an easier job than we have um so yeah. it isn't going to be quick and it's going to take an, a gigantic amount of capital uh yeah. to roll out so like a u.s market we need half a million aircraft yeah. just for about 15 percent of the existing market interesting and, uh, look at the tesla production numbers tesla are only now 
at a million units a year type of thing. Uh, mm. Sorry, a million, it's a lot more than a million units a year now. But if you look at their trajectory for the last 10 years, how many units mm. they built, now they're more complicated objects to build than, than drones. But still, mm. it isn't quick or easy to ramp up scale manufacturing, uh, particularly yeah. with these types of devices. So yeah. therefore, that'll affect the markets we'll choose. We'll cherry pick. I would think. Yeah. One one last question for me before we move on to the quick fire, but um, I, mean, I think you might have kind of hinted at this basically before. But what is your competitive edge? Like, what's your moat basically that no one else is doing, and you can basically, yeah. Now I, I get asked this all the time. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. I, and I'm it's always honest VCs, about it. VCs ask that yeah. question. Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> yeah, I had one, had one a couple hours ago, uh, <laughs> and I'm always truthful. I'm always truthful on this. Yeah. Um, it, it, truly, in in tech, there is no competitive mode other than time and team. And what I mean by that is a world class team with the right attitude that's capitalized sufficiently will beat anyone if they start at the right time, hmm. right? So we did, we started at the perfect time. We're now more ready than anyone else to go into full-scale production because of our timing was right in, in reference to when the regulatory environment opens up. So we have a team that's built unicorns before. Yeah. Our last business together was a unicorn, the world's largest mobility aggregator for airlines. Uh, and before that, we've had a number of successes together. So we're not rocket scientists. We are not the smartest team in the world, mm -hmm. but we we know how to build business. So like I say, it's this isn't to you know promote ourselves. This is simply to say the moat is the team and the timing. Yeah. And so okay. long as you do a good job of capitalizing that team and your strategy is clear and, and you stay focused on that, then that is the moat. Because if anyone started now, to build a competitor to us, they're already at least three years behind. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Well, and on that positive note, we'll move on to the last section of the podcast where it's a quick fire round. So we ask you a few questions. Um, you reply whatever comes to your mind, um, you know, with brevity and uh, in a short couple of sentences, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Let's go. All right. So. If there's one thing that you see wrong about the advanced air mobility ecosystem, um, what what is that? Unit economics. Interesting. Uh, is that unit economics is, is doesn't work right now? I don't think so. It's, if you're referring to pass, passenger aircraft, uh, yeah. unit economics don't work. I don't think. Uh, no one's factoring in. Uh, um, diversions, any of those things in the size okay. of the batteries, the cost of the batteries, and they're assuming a lot about the scaling coming down uh, cost of batteries and the willingness of people to pay. Uh, I haven't seen a rational business case there yet. I'm excited about the industry and I think it's great, but the big problem is definitely unit economics. Cool. Perfect. Next one. Um, so if we do have access to cheap um, ambient pressure, room temperature, superconductors, where do you think, or if, if any at all, you could use that in, in MANA's hardware and operations? I'm actually making some at the moment, just over here in a <laughs> 800 degree sets. But, uh, so it, the, the direct and obvious impact for us is that it will it'll do two things. We, we, you lose a lot of energy in the aircraft because we're high current, so we generate 150, 200 amps and you use a lot of energy just in the in the wires on the way to the motors for that. So that's an efficiency. But the bigger efficiency is the batteries. So with superconductors, your batteries will be able to pack a lot more energy density in. And that's the clear win. But that's 10 years away. Uh, even if that superconductor works, it'll take them 10 years to commercialize that in a way that it, you'll see it in batteries. So we need, unfortunately, to be able to work with current technologies. Um, and therefore, superconductors, um, no time. So, I, I might have an MRI scanner for all my staff, <laughs> you know, the, you know, a head mounted MRI scanner for them, but that's about it. So it will be good uh, for me to launch a competitor to MANA in seven, eight years, maybe. What's the Yes, correct. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. 
Uh, got it. Okay, you you heard it first first on this pod, basically, you know, about that yeah. future company. Um, cool, brilliant. Uh, next one is, what's a book that you would recommend folks to read, basically, and why? Oh, you, you know, I almost one. embarrass myself with yeah. this answer all the time. You know, yeah. it's a, it's always the most recent book for me because I got lucky. <laughs> recent that bias. That's what I read. Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know. Um, but it, Red Notice, uh, Bill Browder, uh, and sorry, not Red Notice. The, the, his his second one, Freezing Order, right? So Red mm -hmm. Notice was about Putin's attempt to capture him and use Interpol because he was an enemy. And Red Notice, or sorry, Freezing Order is where he describes how the proceeds of crime go through mm -hmm. Russia and how Putin is on top of all of this and and the money flow and his his project to block the money and have it frozen through the Matsinsky Act. It's really interesting, well-written read, and it's frightening actually when you read it. So it was a thrilling read. I read it in two sittings. I just couldn't stop. Uh, such a wonderful read. And at the moment I'm reading a book, I don't have it on my desk, uh, Systems Engineering Management for the Apollo Space Program. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit less a little bit more boring, but uh, an important read for me yeah. because systems engineering and systems management are uh, disciplines that uh, exist big time in aviation, and, and it's time I learned them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know the Apollo had like what, like twenty thousand vendors or something like that, basically. Working yeah, on yeah, and they they, they wrote the yeah. book on systems management and systems engineering. And yeah. uh, jo jokes aside, it was as you said, an absolutely gi gigantic program. And this book is like it, it is the book that describes how they achieved it. That's brilliant. Um, cool. Um, name one leader. It can be a government person, can be an entrepreneur, can be anyone um, that you basically look up to and why. Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, I'd have to say Derek Oshoshawi, uh, ah, and Tony Zhu, two, two leaders, two leaders in different, for different reasons. Tony, okay. because what he's built with DoorDash and mm. his team, Stanley and, and the guys have just built an incredible business, very, very tough business to do well. And they've done it well. Uh, and Dara, because I knew Dara from his Expedia days and now he's mm. in Uber and he's, he's just fixed that business. You know I mean? It had yeah, obviously a lot now. of problems, it's, tough, yeah. tough, tough business. And look at their, look at their numbers. It's sensational. And that requires, that is a slog. He, that was a really, really tough job. So mm. I'd say just on pure gray matter, the both of them on resilience, on intelligence, on strategy, bravery, on all fronts, because I know those two businesses as well, because I obviously study them a lot because of my current business. And I, those are the two I give the prize to in equal measures. And Uber yes. is right now uh, free cash flow positive in the last quarter. Yeah, uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Amazing. Yeah, great turnaround. Yeah, great turnaround. Yeah. yeah, it's a case study of its own. Like really. any any yeah. any business, any leader that's crazy enough to run a yeah. business and devote the blood, sweat, and tears to it deserves an award, but those mm. two are next level smart. Uh, so deserve absolutely recognition. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. With that, we shall wrap up this pod. Bobby Healy and Permanent 7 Sil, thanks a lot for being on the pod. And uh, Bobby, all the best with Mana. Hope to see a Mana drone uh, delivering my next coffee uh, before we speak. It's been an absolute pleasure, gents. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bobby. All the best.